Good evening, everyone, and welcome to church tonight. Greetings to those watching online as well, and uh, thanks this evening to Don for leading us in worship this evening. We look forward to continuing our series in Elisha. In other announcements, uh, the services at Beechwood continue on Wednesday and, and Monday, uh, so we do continue to pray for that work. Bible studies are on Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, as you're heading out this evening, there are still some secondhand books uh, in the boxes downstairs in the hall, so do check those out if you've not already. We have our annual congregational meeting tomorrow night at 7 p.m. here at church. So that's tomorrow, Monday the 25th of March, 7 p.m. for our ACM. Next Friday is Good Friday, so we have a church service here at 9 a.m., course next Sunday is Easter Sunday. On the 5th of April coming up we have our next King's Kids so that is uh, a Friday afternoon for King's Kids on the 5th of April uh, followed by King's Youth later on after that into the evening so that's Friday the 5th of April so if that has piqued your interest please do catch Shane and get some more information uh, and there's also a brochure in the lobby about that. And while you're grabbing brochures, there's a, a brochure for our day camp coming up. Uh, it's out at uh, Campbelltown Presbyterian Church with David McDougall as our guest speaker. And that's on the 13th of April. So please do uh, pop your name down on the sign-up sheet in the lobby if you're able to come to that. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. As we come to worship God this evening, for our call to worship, I'll turn to Psalm 47, reading from verses 6 to 9. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is King of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. He reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Let's bow before we come and praise God in song. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we can come before you this evening in worship. We ask as we do so that you would be in our midst through your spirit guiding and directing us. Soften our hearts, calm our minds and bring us into your presence we ask and as we come before you accept our praise hear our prayer and we ask that you would do this for the sake of Jesus your son and our saviour and that your spirit would be at work opening your word to us enlightening us teaching us encouraging us and rebuking and correcting us where we need that Hear us now as we come in your presence for the sake of Jesus Christ, our risen King and Saviour. Amen. Well, we'll come and stand and sing together. Uh, we're going to sing As the Deer, which is taken from Psalm 42. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wow. 
come to God's word now. And we'll read from 2 Kings chapter 6, reading verses 24 through chapter 7, verse 2. So this is a rather grisly account. Afterward, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered his entire army and went up and besieged Samaria. There was a great famine in Samaria as they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said... If the Lord will not help you, how shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the winepress? And the king asked her, what is your trouble? And she answered, this woman said to me, give, you, give, give your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And on the next day I said to her, give your son that we may, may, may eat him. She has hidden her son. King heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. He was passing by on the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth beneath on his body. And he said, May God do so to me, and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. Now the king had dispatched a man from his presence, but before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, Do you see how this murderer has sent to take off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door fast against him. There's not the sound of his master's feet behind him. While he was still speaking with them, the messenger came down and said to him, This trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? But Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time a seer of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Then the captain, on whose hand the king leaned, said to the man of God, If the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? But he said, You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And this is God's word. Amen. And we'll now be waited on for our free will offerings. Let's pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the blessing it is to be able to gather together as your people on such a beautiful afternoon. We know that uh, you've given us uh, all things. We thank you for the opportunity to bring this portion back again this week. We ask that you would make us cheerful givers. We pray that uh, these funds would be used in in such a way that uh, the gospel would be ministered and that more people would know of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, Pete. We're going to continue to read God's word together. We're stay in the Old Testament. We're going to turn to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 28. We're going to read the first six verses and then skip over to verse 58 and read through to the end of this chapter in Deuteronomy. Let's hear God's word together. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. 
and turn over to verse 58, which is in a, a lengthy section that starts at verse 15, and verse 15 opens, but if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, and verse 58 says, if you are not careful to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring on you and your offspring extraordinary afflictions, afflictions severe and lasting, and sicknesses grievous and lasting. And he will bring upon you again all the disease of Egypt, of which you are afraid, and they shall cling to you. Every sickness also and every affliction that is not recorded in the book of this law the Lord will bring upon you until you are destroyed. Whereas you are numerous as the stars of heaven, you shall be left few in number because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And as the Lord took delight in, you, in doing you good and multiplying you, so the Lord will take delight in bringing ruin upon you and destroying you. And you shall be plucked off the land that you are entering to take possession of it. And the Lord will scatter you among all peoples, from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. And among these nations you shall find no respite, there shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot, but the Lord will give you there a trembling heart, and failing eyes, and languishing soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you, Night and day you shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. In the morning you shall say, if only it were evening. And at evening you shall say, if only it were morning, because of the dread that your heart shall feel and the sights that your eyes shall see. And the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt, a journey that I promise that you should never make again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer. And amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's bow now together in prayer. Come before the Lord, we're told this morning of uh, the delay again for Harriet in her surgery. And the expectation or the hope is that the 2nd of April, Tuesday the 2nd of April, just after Easter, will be the next time. So if we We'll just be praying that that will proceed and go ahead. And there's many other things to be passing for, as Shane mentioned this morning, the different laws that are federally before well, being considered around uh, religious discrimination, I think is the best way to put it, and here in New South Wales also. So let's bow and let's pray together. Gracious God and Father in heaven, we come before you again, thankful that you are not a God who is distant and far away and does not hear your people, but you are one who bows down and bows your ear to hear your people. That you enable us to enter your presence through the shed blood of Christ. And it's for his name's sake that you hear us and it's in his name that we come before you now, pleading his merit and his righteousness alone. We thank you for your preserving hand upon us and guiding us over many years. We thank you for having free access to your word and to be able to gather tonight as your people to worship you. We ask, Lord, that you would continue this blessing for us, that you would help us to be people who are faithful and obedient to you because of what you've done for us in Jesus Christ. Continue to use the ministry here, Lord, to reach out to many in our local community. Lord, we pray for those of our midst that are in, uh, going through difficult times and trials. We do remember Harriet before you. And we commit her to your love and your care, asking that you would be close to her, comforting and guiding her. We do ask that you would be uh, overruling schedules for surgery so that on the 2nd of April uh, this operation would go ahead for her, that you would be guiding the hands of the surgeons so that there would be relief and uh, a level of restoration of function for her right arm. 
I'll be with Ross and Matthew and the broader family. Um, and thank you for their loca location close by Harriet, that they can be with her each day. And we just ask your blessing on them as a family through this difficult trial. And we pray for Will. We thank you for the care and support that you have put around him. And we ask that you would strengthen him in his walk with you, that he would bear a good and faithful witness to you, to those carers and support workers that he meets with each and every day. Lord, we remember Wayne and Chrissy and uh, Marcia and Pete and the girls. We just again uphold them uh, as they walk through this journey with Lynn's departure to be with the Lord. Uh, be with them, be close to them, be comforting them, Lord that they may know that you are the God of all comfort and kindness and grace. And Heavenly Father, as we head into the Easter time, we pray for the scripture teachers in our midst and those opportunities in schools. Lord, that you would especially use this time to sow seed in the hearts of those young students that are in the primary schools that we were able to get into and at East Hills Girls High too, uh, that, Lord, the would not just be a historical story or a myth that they hear about, but you would be working so that they would know the truth and the reality of the death, the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray for a Good Friday service here, for Resurrection Sunday also, Lord, that you would be especially working. If any come in, Lord, that you would bring them in to hear your word, to hear of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we think of those who minister overseas. We remember the work of the Middle East Reform Fellowship, uh, especially its reach into those war-torn sections uh, in Palestine and across the Middle East. Lord, may you use those radio transmissions, the internet broadcasts, uh, to reach many who uh, would be struggling with the ravages of war. Reach them with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we pray. We think of your people in India suffering under the persecution of the government there, and with the anti-conversion laws and the persecution they face. And we commend them to you, ask that you would give them strength and courage to continue to proclaim your word. And we especially pray for Vijay and Suchi and Adil and Isabel, that you would uphold them and protect and guide and strengthen them and be using them, Lord. And Heavenly Father, in our own country, we and lament the passing and the consideration of passing laws that will uh, restrict the freedom of Christian schools to employ Christian teachers, of uh, pastors, of, of just ordinary Christians to bear witness to the good grace in Christ Jesus to those who are struggling with same-sex attraction and gender identity issues. Lord, we ask that you would be merciful to our country that you would bring repentance and revival in your church so that the gospel would be faithfully proclaimed. We ask that you would bring the gospel to bear upon those who are in the houses of parliament, members of parliament and senators. And if it is in your good mercy that you would actually bring them to faith in Christ Jesus so that they would seek to serve and honour you in all that they do. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with us now, that you would guide and direct us and that your spirit would be in our midst and we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we come again to stand and to sing and we're going to sing that well-known hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
Well, tonight we turn to a rather horrendous passage, don't we, in 2 Kings chapter 6 through into the beginning of chapter 7. Matthew Henry in his commentary says this actually, the end of chapter 6, should probably be at the beginning of chapter 7. It's a new story, a new episode that we're introduced to. Uh, but if you recall last time uh, when I was preaching on the episode with Naaman and his confession of faith, um, I'd introduced you to this view of uh, sec the section from chapter 2 in 2 Kings through to the end of chapter 7, that these are demonstrations of God's grace. In the middle of it was Naaman and God's grace to a Gentile. And the outside of that was episodes of God's grace shown to the remnant and then bookending it was God's grace to rebellious Israel. Now, last week with Pete Merrick we saw one of those episodes of God's grace to rebellious Israel and I hope you'll see tonight we see another one here in this rather dark and gruesome episode. Last week Peter now, it took us through that episode with the horses and the chariots of fire that the Lord opened the eyes of uh, Elisha's servant to see those. He saw that God was omniscient, he knows what is going on, that God is with us even in the midst of trial and persecution and that God humbles us in how he deals with us. Tonight I want us to look at God's warnings to Israel, that they're not idle, that the consequences of sin are seen, but if that doesn't lead us to repentance, there are consequences. But in all of that, we will see again God showing his grace to this rebellious people in Israel and a, a warning for us at the end in verse 2 of chapter 7, of not doubting or neglecting the grace that God offers to us. So as we start then, let's just bow and pray and ask God to guide us. Heavenly Father, as we come and open your word together, we ask that your spirit would be in our midst guiding us. May the words of my mouth, may the meditation of our heart this night be to your honour and your glory to our encouragement, our building up and our strengthening. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, as I said, this is a rather gruesome episode that we are introduced to here in 2 Kings 6. Ben Hadad, the king of Syria, musters his entire army and comes up and besieges Israel. And first of all, I want us to see how Israel's rebellion has consequences. See from verse 24, afterward Ben Hadad, king of Syria, he musters his army, goes up and besieges Samaria. And there was great famine in Samaria as they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and the fourth part of a cab of doves dung for five shekels of silver. And we read that the king of Israel is passing by on the wall and a woman cries out to him, help my Lord. He says, if the Lord won't help you, how will I help you from the threshing floor or the wine press? The king asked, what is your trouble? She answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And the next day I said to her, Give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Famine and a siege. That's what we're confronted with here. In May 8, 1942, John Curtin, the then Prime Minister of Australia, announced rationing would take place. Ration coupons were issued to limit the quantity of fuel, food products and clothing that an individual consumer could purchase at any one time. Daily quotas on sales were initially put in place generally and then specifically around coupons 
food, etc. And that wasn't lifted until 1950. Now, during that time, advice on living with austerity measures was everywhere. Recipe competitions awarded cash prizes to the cleverest and most frugal meal ideas. Mrs Morn of Queensland won a prize from the Women's Weekly for her recipe for mock sausages. And it goes like this. To make the sausage, boil one cup of rolled oats in three quarters of a cup of salted water for 15 minutes. Then add finely chopped onion to flavour, mix well, empty into a basin. When cool, add one beaten egg, pepper and herbs to taste, one cup of breadcrumbs. Shape into sausages, roll in flour and fry in deep boiling fat till golden brown. Very tasty and a good substitute for meat. Even in our time, not my time, and some of you here in our generations, there has been different style of food made. But it is in that time of austerity, of trial, of war. Uh, we refer back to Soviet Russia. There are stories of Japanese in World War II of cannibalism being recorded in the 20th century. So what we confront here in what Israel is facing is not some myth and far distant story. Here in Israel, we can suppose the country was laid waste and plundered and Samaria is now under siege. Whether suddenly, so they didn't have time to prepare stores, or by reason of the famine, either way, the Syrian plan here seems plain. We'll starve them out rather than storm the city. We read through this and it seems strange to us now, what's 80 shekels of silver for a donkey's head? What's the fourth part of a cab? Well, a shekel in those days was one month's wage. So 80 sh shekels would be maybe three and a half years wages for the head of a donkey. A cab was 20 for a container of 24 eggs. So a quarter of a cab is the equivalent of six eggs. Now, if we converted silver to today's currency, 80 shekels of silver is about $1,000 and five shekels about 66. Would we pay $1,000 for the head of a donkey? Would we pay about $66 for six items of dove's dung? It's gruesome, isn't it? Now, a donkey's head would have had little meat. Maybe there's a bit in the cheeks, but not much more. But it's unwholesome. And if you look back in Leviticus 11, it's an unclean animal. Israel are desperate. Dove's dung, the commentators wrestle with it. It could be literally the dung of doves. No longer used for fire but now to be eaten. Or, as the Hebrew word is suggested to be obscure, it could be just the corn found in the dung of doves, the guts or innards of doves, or a sort of food used among the poor, poorer Israelites. Whichever way you take it, they are in desperate straits and desperate times. And finally, we read in the midst of this, this horrible, barbarous situation where the two women not just talk about taking one son, killing it, but actually do eat of one son and then the other is hidden. That's the what we're confronted with. But we need to ask why. Why is this happening to Israel? And that's why we read in Deuteronomy 28. This is not some uh, abstract 
episode that takes place just with the barbarity of the Syrians playing out. In Deuteronomy 28, in verse 52, we didn't read this bit, but I'll read it for you now. In verse 52, this is in that section headed, uh, but if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, God says this to Israel. They shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout all your land. They shall besiege you in all your towns throughout all your land which the Lord your God has given you. And you shall eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and in the distress with which your enemies shall distress you. The man most tender and refined among you will begrudge food to his brother, to the wife he embraces, and to the last of the children whom he has left, so that he will not give to any of them any of the flesh of his children who he is eating because he has nothing else left in the siege and in the distress with which your enemies shall distress you in all your towns. God has said to Israel, before they enter into the promised land, if you're faithful, obeying the voice of the Lord your God, there will be blessing. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, there is judgment to come. God had warned the Israelites of the consequences for unfaithfulness and for unbelief. This episode in 2 Kings 6 speaks directly back to what I just read from Deuteronomy 28. Not necessarily pretty, it's not easy reading, but it is God being faithful to what he has said. God had continued to warn Israel, hadn't he? We saw in the life of Elijah that battle on Mount Carmel. Who are you going to serve? The Baals or the Lord? He had warned them plenty of times. And yet here they are. Here they are faced again by Ben-Hadad, the king that Ahab had foolishly spared back in 1 Kings 20. So we see in the start here, the people of Samaria are under siege, not due to some random sequence of events, but under God's judgment due to their rebellion. Dale Ralph Davis puts it this way, he says, Here we face not just human deprivation, but divine judgment. God said there might be days like this. This isn't simply Syrian atrocity, but divine judgment and punishment. And so we see the word of God fulfilled. Among the threatenings of God's judgment upon Israel for their sins was this one that they would eat the flesh of their own children, which we would think incredible. Yet here it is. It's come to pass. So we have, first of all then, this episode that shows rebellion, unbelief, unfaithfulness has consequences. And secondly, there is a response from the king, a response of anger and not repentance. Verse 26, the king is passing by on the wall and this woman cries out to him saying, Help my lord, O king. Again he asks her, we read that, what's your trouble? When the king heard the words of the woman, verse 30, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall and the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth beneath on his body. And he said, may God do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. The siege of Samaria is well entrenched. The king is out walking the walls and this woman cries to help to him. Matthew Henry says that the king is most likely out on the wall giving orders for the mounting of the guard posting the archers, repairing the breaches, and this woman cries out to him, cries out for help, 
Where else would she go to? But to the protector of right and the avenger of wrong, the king of Israel. And how does he respond? Initially, in verse 27, he responds, If the Lord will not help you, how shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? He seems to acknowledge that her only help can come from the Lord. It's echoes there of Psalm 124 and verse 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Some think initially this is a fretful response, acknowledging his inability to help. Others, including Matthew Henry and Matthew Poole, indicate that it is impatience and rage that show the character of this king. He's an idolater. He's an infidel. He's a wicked man in a great rage. Let the Lord help you, as a profane scoff, is how Matthew Poole frames this. But then on hearing the details of that barbarous situation, his response changes sharply. We're not told if he renders judgment for the woman, just that he gives way to anguish over the horror this siege was bringing. Outwardly, he tears his clothes and behold, there is sackcloth on his body. Now, sackcloth was a type of cloth made from black goat's hair. It was thick, it was rough, it was a coarse material. It was uncomfortable to wear and later was used as a sack, thus sackcloth. It was used in Old Testament times as an outward sign of mourning and submission. In Genesis 13, Jacob rents his clothes, puts on sackcloth, when he receives Joseph's bloodied coat back from the brothers. In 2 Samuel, David tells Job and the people to put on sackcloth to mourn the murder of of Abner. In Psalm 30, in verse 11, we have this. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. So there is a mourning, there's a sadness that this king is showing. But what comes next in verse 31 is what is telling in his response. And he said, may God do so to me... And more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. The king overlooks his role of leading the people in idolatry, being the root cause of this judgment, and he lays the blame on Elisha. While outwardly he wore clothes of sorrow for everyone to see, His mood is for murder. It's not for repentance. I just want to remove Elisha's head, he cries out. Does that not remind us of Jezebel's threat to Elijah in 1 Kings 19? We're not told, but it is quite probable. Dale Ralph Davis puts it this way, that Elisha had counselled the king to repent or to wait in faith for Yahweh's deliverance Remember last week with Peter, the deliverance that was brought to Israel. But as we get through this, it's like the king is saying, I've had enough, I'm tired of all of this, it's not working, off with Elisha's head. And so there is this fine line between sackcloth and cynicism. Rather than going from mourning to repentance, he drives from sadness to anger. So in all this, let's be careful to note that this circumstance, this providence of affliction fuels anger in the king, not repentance. While his outward appearance appears to show concern for the misery of the people, sorrow at this circumstance doesn't lead to lamentation and repentance for his sin, for the sin of the people. 
both of which are the root cause of this punishment. Instead of pulling down the calves at Dan and Bethel or letting the law's full course be brought on the prophets of Baal, what does he do? Off with Elisha's head, he cries, and he sends a servant off to enact that. But what had Elisha done? Why the anger at Elisha? We don't know. We're not told. Perhaps Elisha foretold this judgment or he was expecting, that is the king was expecting Elisha to pray for removal of the siege and he hadn't. But until the king and the people repented and were ready for deliverance, they had no reason to expect that the prophet would pray. So for us, in times of trial and affliction, in our sorrow, let us turn our lamentation and repentance in submission under God and not be driven in anger against him for the situation. And then third, we see that in the midst of this, God still shows grace to rebellious Israel. From verse 32, we read that Elisha was sitting in his house. The elders were sitting with him. Now, the king had dispatched a man from his presence, but before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, do you see how this murderer has sent to take off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door, hold the door fast against him. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? While he was still speaking with them, the messenger came down to him and said, This trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? But Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, a seer of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Then the captain on whose hand the king leaned said to the man of God, If the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. From verse 32 through to verse chapter 7, verse 2, we come to Elisha now. And God's grace and kindness pronounced to rebellious Israel. Elisha's with the elders. We see again, he knows what the king's plans are. He knows what is coming. He brings the word of the Lord to the king and to his servant, and so in this we have God's grace being foretold, but warning to one who doubts. How this all plays out, We'll see next time when Peter Barnes brings the final section of this chapter. But for now, let's focus on Elisha and this message. He's in his lodgings, as we read. He's with the elders, whether they are sons of the prophets or some godly men, we're not exactly told. And they're with him, whether to receive counsel or comfort, to solicit him to use his power for their relief, But he does not fear the king. He knows the king's plan. He knows the Syrian plans back in chapter 6, verse 12. And so God has revealed to him Israel's king's plan. And he tells the elders what to do. Bar the door. Stop the messenger from coming to take my head from my shoulders. But he knew too that the king was following his messenger, to revoke that order. And in this, he responds, he calls and he says, do you see this murderer has sent to take off my head? If you have the King James or New King James Version, it renders that as son of a murderer. And some of the commentators uh, see it best rendered this way, So that here the king of Israel is literally the son of Ahab and Jezebel who, when you think back to uh, 1 Kings 18 and the murder of Naboth for the vineyard, they were murderers. 
And so here is this king. He is both there, he's both the son of a murderer by descent and also by disposition. He's well composed with the elders, is Elisha. And this spirit of prophecy that he has as a prophet authorises him to call this king the son of a murderer. It's a strong response to the messenger of the king. You see Jesus likewise elementing a strong response. This morning we were looking at Jesus cleansing the temple. In John 8, 44, he says to the Jews that you are of your father, the devil. There are times when God will authorise his people with such strong response. And so the king arrives. Matthew Henry and Matthew Poole view that verse 33 is the king speaking to Elisha rather than just his messenger. If you take it that way, then it's the king saying, this trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait any longer? The king seems to have been in this struggle between his convictions and his corruption and he abandons himself to despair. He lays the blame for all of this on God, not upon his own sin or his mother and his father. The inference in this statement is one of foolishness and wickedness. Why should I wait any longer, he says. But when we compare that to Eli, to David, to Job, as they waited in times of trial and suffering, they grew patient where this king grew outraged. And yet, Elisha has good news. It's as if the one that the king has offended by saying, why should I wait for the Lord any longer, the one he's refused to wait upon for deliverance, that one, the Lord God, by his own grace and bounty, sends glad tiding of relief and deliverance for this king and for the people of Israel. In verse 1, Elisha says, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time a seer of fine flour will be sold for a shekel, two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. About this time tomorrow, 24 hours away, there will be deliverance and relief. But notice, Elisha isn't promising cheap food, but relief from the siege. He's saying that things will begin to return to normal. Notice we have flour and barley, replacing a donkey's head and dove's dung. As I said before, one shekel was about a month's wage. It's not cheap flour, but there is nonetheless flour and it's not $1,000 for the head of a donkey. Matthew Henry says of this, man's extremity is God's opportunity of magnifying his own power. His time to appear for his people is when their strength is gone. And for us, as we head into remembering the Lord Jesus' death, resurrection at Easter time, Does that not remind us Romans 5, verse 8 and verse 10, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Elisha tells them to hear the word of the Lord, to hear it, to heed it, to believe it, for tomorrow the siege will be raised. The gate of the city opened. Although the king had threatened his life, God promises to save the king's life and that of rebellious Israel. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. But as we come to the end of this in verse 2, we see this response of the captain on whose hand the king leaned. And you remember what Naaman's role in Syria was? He was the captain of the king's army. 
Remember, he asked for forgiveness of Elisha in with his confession of faith before he headed back to be forgiven for going into the temple and bowing down. That's the captain of the Syrian army. Here's the captain of the Israelite army. His response? Even if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? Is the Lord going to rain down manna just like he did in the wilderness? There's a scepticism, there's a doubt from this captain of the Israelite army. And then comes this sad announcement of a just punishment for this perilous and imperious unbelief. In his statement, he is making Elisha and therefore God a liar. If the Lord himself should make the windows of heaven, should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And Elisha says to him, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. It's like the promise of relief is too much for this captain to believe and so he doubts. In fact, he denies. And as a result, he's excluded from enjoying the blessing of the promise. Just like murmuring Israel saw the land, the promised land, but could not enter, so those that believe not the promise of eternal life, says Bishop Patrick, they shall see it but at a distance. So as we come to conclude this gruesome section, this barbarous episode, there is still grace there being shown, being offered to Israel. And Dale Ralph Davis, I like the way he puts this, that the Old Testament, like the New, expects and demands faith, but it requires that we believe what Jehovah has promised. Not some general faith that he will do unheard or bizarre things. If God has promised deliverance, however wild that may seem, we are to believe it. We must believe what Yahweh has said, no matter how unlikely. If we think to John 10, John 6, sorry, John 6 and verse 40, where Jesus says, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Do we believe that as we're standing at the graveside of the loved one being buried? In chapter 10 and verse 28, again, Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Do we believe that? And in Philippians 2, from verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Will you believe the deliverance that God has promised in his Son, Jesus Christ? Or will you be like this captain of the army, left to see it with your own eyes, but at a distance? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we lament that sin has such consequences, but we know that you are the same yesterday, today and forever. You have promise blessing for obedience and there is punishment for unfaithfulness and unbelief in our unbelief lord help us grant us faith in christ jesus in the one who has gone to the cross to pay the penalty for our sin who has risen to bring us new life and who ascended and is at your right hand now making intercession for us. Lord, let us be those who are faithful 
in trusting you, in believing your promises and in following after the Lord Jesus all our days. And we ask this for his name's sake. Amen. Well, we'll stand and sing our last hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And then we will stay standing and sing our benediction together. his life 